Hello everybody, welcome to the NPTEL course on the English Romantic Writer 1798 to 1832. In the previous sessions, we have looked at the context in which Romanticism arose, its connections with European philosophies, context within England, political, social and cultural. We have focused on the fact that English Romantic literature, poetry and uh, fiction drew upon contexts such as the rise of revolutionary sentiments, the larger question of rights for women and others, but also philosophical thought on questions of sensibility, passion and sentiment. We also made it a point to note that uh, authors like William Wordsworth were very keen on developing ideas about the sentimental response to say nature, other humans, racial and cultural others. So while the empire or slavery may have been contexts of the romantic writers in writing their prose, fiction, poetry and others, there was a dominant attitude and that dominant attitude informed by questions of European ideas on sentiment and passion introduced the theme of sensibility. Sensibility and passion, which is a subject of today's uh, lecture here, drew upon various sources. The 18th century sentimental novel, European ideas of sentiment, passion and feeling. It has wide sources such as Jean Jacquemus Rousseau and fiction. Henry Mackenzie's novel, The Man of Feeling, has often been credited with the making of a new genre, the sentimental novel. And the literature of sensibility evolving out of this 18th century phenomenon has several distinguishing features. The literature is marked by a huge amount of self-reflexivity. Uh, therefore, what you normally find is the first person narrative dominates the genre. But interestingly, the narrator's focus in the first person narrative is not only on the seeing I, as in me, but on the process of seeing, perception. You will recall some of the material we have discussed on Coleridge, where Coleridge in poems like the Aeolian Harp was not only talking about nature, but on the poet's perceptions of nature. In Wordsworth, we have noticed how when, for instance, writing about the experience of Tintern Abbey or Shelley in the experience of the Skylark focuses on how the poet, how the speaker perceives these objects in nature. So the process of seeing, perception and assimilation of the world is central to the literature of sensibility. This is what we now understand in theoretical work in the 20th century as self-reflexive writing. There is self-reflexivity in the narrative, particularly in, in the novel and in poetry, where attention is paid to the process of composition as well. What do we mean by this? That is, when Wordsworth is documenting how he perceives Tintern Abbey, so as he walks across the landscape, he looks at Tintern Abbey, the river, the woods around and, and the pastoral setting, he writes about how he sees this composition of nature, but also the composition of his own writing. So in many cases, self-reflexivity is not only about the attention paid to the process of perception through the eye, perception through the senses, including hearing, but also to the process of composing the piece of literary artifact. Protagonists in such literature are represented as very easily moved by sights and stories of human deprivation and suffering. So in Henry Mackenzie's Man of Feeling, to which we will turn in a minute or two, and Wordsworth will speak about not just seeing, but the effect of seeing something. So you will recall poems like The Solitary Reaper, Tintern Abbey, The Aeolian Harp, and many of the uh, poetry that we have already discussed, including Shelley's The West Wind Ode and others, will showcase the effect of the natural elements on the speaker. Which means to say, if I am moved by something, I will document what I am moved by and how I am sentimentally affected. So the literature of sensibility showcased not only suffering, but the response to human suffering. And this is very important. It's very important because as contemporary critics like Lynn Hunt have argued, this is a foundation for a massive campaign for human rights as well. But that's not really the subject of our conversation now. What I want you to understand is, Protagonists in literature of sensibility are often moved by sights, stories and visual spectacles of human deprivation or human suffering. To be sensible meant to be conscious, to be aware and having the sensibility capable of tender or delicate feeling. 
So, it is not only about awareness, but the ability to feel on behalf of the suffering other. Please understand this. It is different from what we have discussed so far, because it is not only about me. It is not only about my senses, my sensations, my passions and my intellect. It is about how I respond to the outside world. So, it is about formal narrative, discursive and sentimental response to the other. In order to illustrate this, I am putting up on the next couple of slides an instance from Henry Mackenzie's The Man of Feeling. Here is a longish excerpt. Read the excerpt carefully. It is about a woman who is standing to one side and according to Mackenzie's writing shows a dejection, but a dejection of a decent kind and which says Mackenzie moves our pity unmixed with horror. It moves our pity and that is the key phrase I want you to keep in mind. It showed a dejection of the decent kind which moves our pity unmixed with horror. Upon her therefore, the eyes of all were immediately turned. Notice what is happening in the first five lines. There is a description of the um, sad, pale and wasted woman. Then there is a description of the audience that all attention of the audience is focused on this woman's suffering. What do we mean by this? What, what do we understand by this? What Mackenzie is talking about is that as this woman appears on the scene, the audience's perceptions are all focused on her. The narrative talks about not only the focusing of attention, but the effect of that attention on the audience. So, you observe people observing, you observe people's sentiments. This is important and through the account then, uh, the story is being narrated. The keeper who accompanied them observed, this is a young lady who was born to ride in her coach and six. She was beloved, if the story I have heard is true, by a young gentleman, her equal in birth, though by no means her match in fortune. But love, they say, is blind and she fancied. This is a story being narrated by, uh, 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 by an innkeeper and he is narrating the story of the woman's downfall of her being reduced to this situation and it is a story calculated to arouse in you sympathy and pity. Look at the next slide. The story is now over as in the keeper has narrated the story and the focus now shifts from the woman, the keeper to one member in the audience, Harley. Mackenzie writes, it had particularly attracted Harley's notice. He had given it the tribute of some tears. This is the man of feeling. Remember what I have said, it is not only a question of perception, but the effect the perception has on me that is important. And it says here, Mackenzie writes here, though this story was told in very plain language, it had particularly attracted Harley's notice. He had given it the tribute of some tears. The unfortunate young lady had till now seemed entranced in thought, with her eyes fixed on a little garnet ring she wore on her finger. She turned them now upon Harley. My Billy is no more, said she. Do you weep for me, Billy? Blessings on your tears. I would weep too, but my brain is dry and it burns, it burns, it burns. Please note the melodramatic language. She drew nearer to Harley and this is the response being recorded for us. Be comforted, young lady, said he. Your Billy is in heaven. Is he indeed? And shall we meet again? And shall that frightful man pointing to the keeper not be there? Alas, I am growing naughty of late. I have almost forgotten to think of heaven. Yet I pray sometimes when I can. I pray and sometimes I sing. Now, notice this rather melodramatic piece of dialogue and scene from Henry Mackenzie's novel on the man of feeling. It began, as you know, with the arrival of this woman in the midst of a group. The keeper narrates the story and now, the effect on Harley is being recorded. He has shed some tears and the woman has a little conversation with him. Do you weep for my Billy? Now, Harley does not know Billy. Harley does not know this woman. What he responds to is the power of the story. I want you to understand this. It is the power of the narrative that moves Harley. It is the power of evocative, melodramatic language that moves Harley. This is a literature of sensibility, which requires a very different form of language and narration. And he of course, bursts into tears. He does not burst into tears, but he has some tears flowing. 
it is in the expression of sympathy for the deprived, for the underprivileged, for the oppressed, that the protagonist's humanity is really proved. Sensibility is a marker of the human. In other words, how do we know Harley is human? We know Harley is human because he responds by, with tears to the woman's story and the woman's appearance. To be sentimental is what defines the human. Not intellect, but sentiment. So not head, but heart. Now, if you think carefully about this, this is a theme that has continued from the literature of sensibility of the late 18th and early 19th century all the way to cyborg cultures in the present, where the cyborg is distinguished from humans because the cyborg cannot feel. It can think, but it cannot feel. And the entire reinvention of cyber, cyborg, cybernetic organisms in films like Robocop or Terminator is to show the increasing sentimentalization of a cyborg because of some human element. Sensibility is the marker of the human. What then is the function of such scenes of sentiment? As in, what purpose does it serve? The function of such scenes of sentiment draws out the human in us, that is the reader. Um, it shows us the erroneous ways of mankind. It shows us that X does not respond to, to this evocative situation of suffering. Uh, but Y does so. So Y is more human than X. Mackenzie would say in A Man of Feeling, I have observed one ingredient, somewhat necessary in a man's composition towards happiness, which people of feeling would do well to acquire, a certain respect for the follies of mankind. So sensibility was a combination then of not just sentiment and passion, but something else. And that is the key paradox in the literature of sensibility. Note what Mackenzie is saying. A respect for the follies of mankind. You respect the errors of the ways of man. Sensibility is a combination of reason and sentiment. John Locke may have inaugurated this view when he actually wrote this in an essay concerning human understanding, to which I'll turn in a second. Sensibility is therefore not just pure passion, pure sentiment. It's a mixture of reason and sentiment because you respond evocatively to suffering, but you're also aware of human flaws. Human flaws are detected through processes of evaluation. Evaluation requires a certain rationality, a certain set of rational criteria. And that is what we are looking at here. So sensibility is a combination of reason and sentiment. John Locke writes in an essay concerning human understanding, and I quote, to this I answer in one word from experience, in that all our knowledge is founded, and from that it ultimately derives itself. Our observation employed either about external sensible objects or about the internal operations of our minds perceived and reflected on by ourselves. Perceived and reflected on by ourselves. At this point, I would like to draw your attention to something we have already discussed, and that is Wordsworth's famous definition of poetry in the preface to the Lyrical Ballads, where he spoke about the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings and emotions, and later qualifies it by saying, that's not all. What Wordsworth says is, it's the recall, yes, but it's recall of emotions recollected in tranquility. And through preface to the lyrical ballads, Wordsworth would speak not only about sentiment, but about remembering, recalling, and reformatting sentiment. He does not say we take the language of the uh, rural folk, which is his famous contribution, but he then says we adapt it. Wordsworth's contradiction is to say there is sentiment, then there's a reflection on sentiment, as in the thinking about sentiment, which is basically what John Locke is talking about here as well. So thinking, therefore, in the 18th century, involves two things, senses and passions. Senses and passions do not themselves dominate reason, but they're integral to the process of rational thinking. So the word sentiment became a vehicle for the synthesis of reason and of emotion. The idea of sensibility and sentiment as the inner core of the human arose during this particular period, somewhere around the mid uh, 18th century. What the ideologues and proponents of sentiment argued was, when reason loses its moral authority and becomes less normative, sentiment comes into play. So when there is no um, moral authority to logic or rationality or reasoning, sentiment takes its place. It becomes the condition of us as in normal humans. Emphasis therefore on a combination of, of, of both. Having situated that context firmly, let's turn to a couple of poems. William Wordsworth's The Mad Mother, which is classifiable as a poem of sensibility. Coming up next on a set of three slides is the poem.
her eyes are wild, her head is bare and there she proceeds. And after the first stanza, she is singing a song um, in the English tongue as Wordsworth makes very clear. It's addressed to her child, sweet babe. They say that I'm mad. And then she says, but nay, my heart is far too glad and I'm happy when I sing. And she goes on and in the next stanza she will refer to, Oh, love me, love me, little boy, thou art thy mother's only joy. And do not dread the waves below, when o'er the sea rock's edge we go. The high crack cannot work me harm, nor leaping torrents when they howl. The babe I carry on my arm. She describes her life. I am thy father's wedded wife and all of that. And she describes her plans for the child. I will teach my boy the sweetest things. I'll teach him how the owlet sings, my little babe. Thy lips are still and thou hast almost sucked thy fur. What had gone in my own dear child? Smile on my little lamb, she says, for I, thy own dear mother am. My love for thee has well been tried. I have sought thy father far and wide. I know the poisons of the shade. I know the earth nuts fit for food. Then pretty dear, be not afraid. We'll find thy father in the wood. Now laugh and be gay to the woods away and there my baby will live for a. Now notice what the poem does. The mother's sentiments emerging from her financial and social conditions serve as triggers for the listeners. The poem invites us to respond in a certain way. The poem tells us, look at this mother. This mother is poor. The mother looks injured or is unable to take care of the baby. That is our cue to behave, respond, react in certain ways. Um, that is a sentimental poem. And in, in the middle of the sentimental poem is a sad story. So let's get this right. The literature of sense melody forces you to pay attention to the mad mother's mental and emotional states. But it also points out that there is, this is a consequence of a very specific financial condition. Financial conditions are subject to scrutiny which are not necessarily sentimental but objective and economic. Basically reason and rationality. This is the point I'm trying to make that there is a merging of the sentimental and the objective slash uh, rational in a poem like this. Having said that, we need to also address something else. The novel of sentiment and sensibility believed in the power of the nervous system. Um, some of you may recall if you have read the Victorians Nerves is a medical condition common to the literature of the entire 19th century. People suffer from nerves. John Locke valorized the nervous system as the key to human understanding. So the nervous system is at the heart of the human, more than say muscles. What does that mean? As in what does it imply? It implies that there has to be a greater emphasis on our senses and nerves rather than on bones or muscles. So it marks a considerable shift from the focus on the human to the question of what constitutes the human. So the nerves, the nervous system and sensibilities are more central, shall we say, to the making of a human. Inga Brody, from whom I shall quote now, um, makes this connection very clear. As sympathy and sensibility replace charity, the emotions in the sensible spectator become more important than any actions that this virtuous observer may take to alleviate suffering. Personality and spontaneous overflowing feeling replace character, plans, discipline, and eventually action. Nerves and glands came to bear greater ethical significance than muscles. What is Inga Brody talking about here? The question of an audience responding in a certain way to subjects, objects, events of suffering is based on my, as in if I am the spectator, on my um, nervous system. It is based on my responses to whatever I am seeing. The important thing to realize is this is transformed into an ethical condition to be able to respond to the other because the ethics, ethics are always directed at the other. There is no such thing as an ethics directed at myself. Ethics is always directed at the other. So the cornerstone of the literature of sensibility is the ethical significance of a certain kind of sentimental response. This is something you need to keep in mind and if you look at what we have said about the Mad Mother poem, Wordsworth's Mad Mother poem, you pay attention to her suffering, sentiment, cries and tears, but you also keep in mind the cause of that suffering which is economic, which is therefore social. In short, what we need to understand about the literature of sensibility is that there is no such thing as pure sentiment in Wordsworth's poetry or Shelley's work. 
There is no such thing as pure passion. Passion, sentiment, affect are all rooted in specific social contexts. So the literature of sensibility, which forms the backbone of the English Romantic writers, is not about pure sen sentiment. It's not about pure passion. It's a mixture of everything. But what is important to remember is the emotional melodramatic text evokes and invokes a certain set of sentiments in the readers. It evokes a certain kind of response. That is at the heart of the Romantics. So the Romantics is not only about how Wordsworth responds to nature. It is how Wordsworth engineers our response to nature via his poetry. So please keep this in mind in our recall here that romantic poetry is not only about sentimentalizing the Cumberland beggar, um, the female vagrant, um, the characters at the foot of Mont Blanc. Romantic poetry is about the evocation and inspiration of passion and sentiment on the part of the reader. Thank you.